Hello, you're listening to Book to the Library, a segment of the Gaston Speaks podcast, featuring the audio recordings of the Book to the Library author talks from the Gaston County Public Library. On November 6, 2018, author Christina McMorris visited the library to discuss her then recently released book, Sold on a Monday, and her journey as an author. And I'm so excited to introduce to you today Christina McMorris. She is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author. She lives in Oregon with her husband and two sons. And her novels are inspired by true personal and historical accounts and have garnered more than 20 national literary awards. She has a talent for transporting us back in time with her stories. And her latest work, Sold on a Monday, does not disappoint. It fits right in with that genre. Um, it is inspired, I think she's going to tell you a little more about it, by an actual newspaper photo that stunned readers across the country, and she'll be telling us more about that. So um, it's an honor to have, have her with us today, and let's please welcome Christina McMorris. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is it morning or afternoon? I guess it's afternoon. I'm on West Coast time. Bear with me. <laughs> I have to bring my water here because I have a, it was a dry cough that I picked up two months ago when the tour started, so front row, don't worry. You're, you're totally safe if I cough a little. So I have to tell you, I'm on a 50-stop book tour right now, which is also known as insane. Yes, thank you for the gasp. That's how it feels every day. Um, and so I have to tell you, though, I'm about halfway through right now, and I flew in last night, and I can already tell you this is one of my favorite cities in the whole world, and here's why. Yesterday, when I was about to sprint at Minneapolis Airport to make my connection from Concourse B to G, as in, oh my G, it is really far away. Um, I had 10 minutes to get there, and one of my four wheels decided to break. So when I showed up with shaking arms and sweaty by the time that I arrived here late last night, when I saw the illuminated sign at your airport that said Brookstone, it became my favorite place in the whole world. <laughs> I nearly hugged the woman. So yes, we're good now for the rest of the 16 days. I am out right now. So I couldn't do, obviously, a tour like this without a lot of family support, as you can imagine. So just to prove it to you, I'm going to show you the survival pack my husband put together with my boys, who are 12 and 15, going on 40. To understand this fully, you have to know that they are both Boy Scouts, both the boys are. One is about to be an Eagle Scout, and my husband is also an Eagle Scout and a search and rescue first responder. This should explain a lot about what's not just on the outside, which he reminds me what tour I'm doing, so that's always helpful. And the second part is a warning for you all, which is careful or you'll end up in my novel, and this is true. <coughs> the inside is really the magical part here, as you can see. There is everything in here from not just one, but two flashlights. I have zip ties, a carabiner, and braided rope, and a sleep sack. Clearly, their view of a book tour was very different from mine. <laughs> I thought it was a little bit of overkill, as you might agree, until the hurricanes hit. <laughs> and I was flying straight toward it, and I thought, you know what, this, this survival pack actually might be very handy. So hopefully we won't need it today. Before I talk about my new shiny toy, sold on a Monday, which, by the way, I'm very excited. I just have to share with you all, since you're my first talk since this. It just hit the New York Times and USA Today list last week. So thank you. So we're, thank you all. So we're pretty excited and really grateful to bookstores and to readers like you for coming out for things like this and buying the book. So thank you. Um, so before I get into all of that, I thought I would share a little bit about my journey as what I call the accidental author, because I had no plans to be a creative writer just a handful of years ago. It's about 12 years ago, I was an uh, event planner and uh, also did weddings. I did 14 weddings a summer. It, when I say I've seen hundreds of YMCA and chicken dances, this is not an exaggeration. <laughs> seen enough for a lifetime, let me tell you. I was also a PR director and I hosted TV shows for a lot of my life. So I was all about efficiency and being a mom. So I had no plans to sit down and write something that would take me, you know, a couple years and 400 plus pages. What happened was I went up to visit my grandmother up on the Hood Canal in Washington to interview her for the biographical section of a homemade cookbook, which I'm sure a lot of you have in your families. It was full of recipes that my grandmother had collected and created over decades. And I decided it would be fun to put it in a book as a Christmas present for the grandkids. Kind of at the, almost as an afterthought, decided to put a little bit about her life in there. I thought, wouldn't it be fun to show you know, what it was like, that, how she grew up, etc. And she started sharing with me 
her life on the farm in Iowa as an Iowa farm girl. Now, I knew a little bit about that already. What I did not know is that every morning before school, she would get the eggs from the chickens and milk the cows before walking eight miles to school. Uphill both ways. <laughs> in a snowstorm naked, yes, I'm sure of it. She also ended up sharing with me that she and my late grandfather, whom I was very close to but passed away many years ago, had only dated twice during World War II. They'd exchanged letters the entire time. He came home on leave, they got married, and were married for 50 years until he passed away. And then she said, would you like to see the letters? Seemed like a trick question. So absolutely yes. And we sat down that afternoon and pored over these beautiful yellow wrinkled pages that a 19-year-old sailor wrote that didn't know if he'd be coming home tomorrow. And when I left her house, I thought, again, the non-writer, and actually even, and I hate to say this in a library, the non-reader at the time. I was a big movie buff though, so I've always loved the art of storytelling and I've done a lot of catching up since then. I'm half Irish, so genetically I have to be a storyteller. And so when I left, I thought, this would make a really good movie. It'd be like The Notebook meets Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> and what if the soldier fell in love through letters, but it was a different girl writing back? How would you know who you were truly in love with? It would be Cyrano de Bergerac set during World War II. That is a movie I would go see. Now I tucked that idea away in my brain somewhere, and a few years later, I was pregnant here with my second child. I was high on hormones, and if any of you have been a mother, you know then that you think that if you are creating life, suddenly writing a book didn't seem that hard. I am not exaggerating, sadly. And I called my mother, who clearly has an irrational amount of faith in her children, because I said, Mom, I think I'm going to write a book. She knows that I'm barely a reader, let alone a writer, and she said, oh, honey, I think you should. So I did, and thankfully, she believed in me. And I sat down and started creating this outline for this novel, and very quickly realized that I was clueless, that I really didn't know how to take the movie in my head and put it on the pages for hopefully you to see. So I started doing a lot of catching up, something I should have done from the beginning, which was read, read, read. I read, and I learned the craft more, and I went to workshops, and I got critiques and everything else that I had to do for this book, including a ton of research which you can imagine, coming out of the gate, World War II, hint to you, is probably not the first book you want to write. There are people still alive to tell you, no, you are wrong. So I did do that. And you can see here, I also did a lot of plotting. And this is my very high-tech plotting board, which I'm sure you're all very impressed with. I like to say that if the uh, post-it company ever goes out of business, I will have to quit my job because I love my many post-its. And I know a lot of authors have different ways of plotting and writing, and so I like to share this. And what it is, is I still do this with every book. I take these mini post-its and I'll just write, each one has, uh, stands for a chapter. And I write a few words on each one just to let me know that it absolutely has to be in the book. Even if the reader doesn't know why, I know why it's there. And when I speak to students in schools a lot, I explain that it, think of it as a Jenga game. You've all played that, yes? And so if you can take the block out and it still stands perfectly, you probably don't need it in the book. And the two different colors just represent the points of view. So I remembered where I was in the story. Now, I ended up writing that first draft, and I will tell you that it was absolutely horrible and terrible, but my mother loved it, <laughs> as she should. And I started racking up all you know, the nice rejection letters. The one good thing about that draft, which still stands to this day in book form, is that I got to include real stories from life that were just too good to pass up and are stranger than fiction. And the two that I'll share with you today very quickly, this is my grandfather, who you can see was clearly 12 when he served in the Navy. <laughs> and he shared with me once, which was probably a PG version of the story, but he did share that after joining the Navy after Pearl Harbor was attacked, as many boys did, he was 17, got special permission from his mother to do that. He went out with his Navy buddies and did what most American sailors did at the time, and that is drink way too much alcohol. And when he woke up in the morning, he had a bandage covering his entire forearm. And I remember thinking, the terror that must go through your mind as you're peeling back the tape to see what tattoo is now on your arm forever. Luckily, she was clothed for his grandchildren's <laughs> sake. And it was a sailor girl. And her hands were on her hips, have you seen this, with the bell-bottom pants and the hat tipped to the side. And the coolest part about this was he could move his knuckles and make her jiggle and dance. <laughs> which of course had to go in the book because you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> the other thing I'll share with you quickly also has to do with military. My mom and I had just dropped off my youngest sister at school in Boston. 
We got on the plane to fly home, and the captain announced that there were some soldiers coming back from Iraq, and everybody applauded and welcomed them home. One of them sat right behind me, and I'm sure he was exhausted and tired and just wanted to get home. And he sat next to a very nice gentleman who was also very loud that was very excited about the fact that he had served in the Army at one point in his life and wanted to regale stories the whole trip. At one point, he ended up sharing, you know, I remember back in basic training, I served with a guy whose last name was S-E-R, sir. First day of tra basic, he said the sergeant came over and said, I hope you don't expect me to call you sir, private. He said he got so many push-ups and sit-ups, all account of that blasted name. And my mother leaned over and said, I hope you're going to use this. I said, you better believe I'm going to use this. <laughs> Now, after many, many drafts, like I said, I ended up collecting a nice stack of rejection letters. If you're impressed by this pile, you should not be, because this is only the form rejections that say, dear author, dear writer, while I see a lot of promise in your work. I thought, wow, everybody has promise. At least they're giving us hope in our form rejection letters. I knew that I started making some progress when I started getting dear Miss McMorris before they rejected me. And what I would do, and this is what I tell to the students I speak to as well, doing anything in a business that is hard like this, and especially in the arts, is that I knew it was only going to take one yes. So every time I got a rejection, which is always a bummer, they come faster now, you know, on the email rather than the self-addressed stamped envelope, thank goodness. And every time I got that rejection, I would be bummed out for a couple minutes, and then I would immediately send out two more submissions. Because then suddenly I had more hope than I had disappointment. And I knew that I just needed that one yes. And in the meantime, while I sent out those letters, I would work on the book and work on the book and try to make it better. Hopefully that then they would request it, I'd be ready to go. Eventually it paid off and it became my first novel, Letters from Home. You can see I was pretty darn excited. My whole family was. It takes a village when those books came in. The only problem about selling to a large New York house was it came with a two book contract. Now for most writers, you think, oh yay, I'm employed for one more book. In my case, remember, I wasn't planning to write one book, let alone two. So suddenly I had a little bit of panic, and then that subsided because I remembered one story a family friend had passed along. He once shared that he had served for the US while his brother served for Japan. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that make an interesting World War II brother story? So that is what I set out to write. While I was researching, however, I ended up coming across a mention of 200 non-Japanese spouses who lived in the camps voluntarily, in the internment camps in the US. I had never heard of that before. Uh, they ended up not wanting to be separated from their spouses or their children. And so I felt this was a story that I hadn't heard told before. Now for me, I remember thinking, well, I could kind of relate a bit to living between worlds. So you can see here I am half Japanese. My father is an immigrant from Kyoto. You can see how confused I was from the start. <laughs> and I remember growing up at school and really wanting to be that all-American girl and not appreciating my differences until I was much older. So I thought, that is a story that I could relate to and tell. Well, as I started researching for this book, I ended up coming across these nuggets of history that I'll pass along to you today because I think they're important not to be forgotten. Some of the stories that aren't usually told and that is the fact that you only had to be 1 16th Japanese in order to be considered an enemy of the state. Now, if any of you have taken a DNA ancestry test, you know that you are 1 16th goodness knows what. You're probably all Japanese and just don't even know it yet. When my husband came home and I shared that tidbit with him, I remember he was taken aback and he said, Chris, that would be our kids. Our kids are one quarter Japanese. They like to refer to themselves as one quarter ninja, which sounds much cooler. <laughs> But yes, I said that would be our family, which is pretty incredible. My, my oldest son just shared yesterday, as I was flying, he emailed me and let me know that he was reading Farewell to Manzanar for school and was very familiar with it because I had already been there. That is Manzanar on the right. And I also ended up learning about the adopted children. No idea that there were Japanese babies, of course, who were adopted by white American families and were suddenly now told that they were enemies of the state. And they were taken away from those families. There were 100 kids that were put in an orphanage, basically, at Manzanar, or relocation camp in California, and put in the children's village. And they were raised there for time by a priest and two nuns, and having no idea when they'd be sent home to their families. And I just couldn't imagine that story. So the only last thing I'll share with you is that I also had the privilege of interviewing about seven men who served in the 442nd and also the MIS, which a lot of people don't know about. The Military Intelligence Service is a secret branch of the US Army probably most well-known because of the movie as the code talkers or the wind talkers. 
They were Japanese Americans who were serving for America. You know, they were interrogators and translators for Japan. I'm sorry, for America against the Japanese, even sometimes serving on the front lines where you could potentially be shot by either side. And one of them ended up sharing a story with me one night when I was interviewing him. He said that he was serving in the Pacific with a Marine unit because you could be placed with any, any type of unit. And one night, these Japanese fighter planes came flying over. They shot them all down and killed them all. And not until four months later did he find out that one of them was his brother. And these are the stories that are so shocking that if you put it in a novel, people would think, oh, that's so far-fetched. You know, but that is often how life is, of course, as we know. Now, ultimately, my story became Bridge of Scarlet Leaves, and it was about a, which I see today, which is exciting to see it here, about an aspiring violinist in Los Angeles in 1941 who secretly elopes with her Japanese-American boyfriend, expecting a very different life until the next morning when Pearl Harbor is bombed. And it ends up dividing two families that are torn between sides. Now, I ended up realizing very quickly, as I'm sure you can imagine, that one of my favorite things to do about my job is to research at first-hand experiences, so like the interviews and the memoirs and writing on a B-17. That is a really, really good day at work, and I will tell you that this is also proof that my husband totally gets me because this was a Mother's Day present. <laughs> I ended up going up with nine other people, and when you take off, and if, it travels around the country, so I definitely encourage you or if, you know, if somebody that you, that you love loves something like this to, to check it out. Once it took off, there were 10 of us, and we got to roam the plane the entire time. And as soon as I got up to the cockpit, you realize you have to crawl under the cockpit. These are not, you know, big people that served. Of course, you saw my 12-year-old, um, my 12-year-old grandfather who served in the in the Navy. I crawled under there and sat on the nose gunner seat. And there was plexiglass completely under your feet. And I'm looking down at the green fields in Hillsboro, Oregon, and thinking, wow, this is so beautiful and relaxing because we're not being shot at. And of course, that would be a very different experience. The other thing I did, which was most memorable, is I ended up going to Alcatraz. Now, my mother, still still supportive, had decided that she was going to go with me on any research trip that I invited her to. I think she wanted to go to Paris, <laughs> hoping I'd set a story in maybe New Orleans or Florence. And instead, I took her on a night tour of a prison. So the only thing that I'll share with you here is that I was standing before one of the cells You know that, that they claimed that the uh, Morris uh, Frank Morris, I believe his name is. It's been a little, little uh, time since I've studied them and Anglins and, uh, and about their great escape and whether or not they really truly made it out, which was fascinating. And the other thing I'll share with you is about a few days before this trip, I called my mother and I said, I'm so excited. Um, I found out that you could possibly spend the night at Alcatraz. I'm not sure how, but I'm going to find out. I'm calling park rangers, I'm emailing, I'm trying to figure it out. And she said, good luck to you, Christina. I'll be at the Hilton. <laughs> so, clearly her love only goes so far. Now, I decided that for the next book, I was going to be so smart. I was going to forget about the historical fiction and cut down my research by at least two-thirds. And I came up with this story that I saw based on a, a Dateline interview that was about this little boy who apparently was suffering from night terrors of dying in a plane crash during World War II. And his parents thought it was odd, but didn't quite believe it for a time, and you know, for whatever your belief system is, they were skeptics until he started sharing things like quirks about the airplanes that only pilots apparently knew, guys that he served with, and the name of the Japanese destroyer that shot the plane down. His parents ended up writing a memoir called Soul Survivor, and I was fascinated by it because my oldest son also used to suffer from night terrors and talk about a grandma that used to take care of him. You know, and, and of course it could be just pure imagination, but night terrors are no fun. If you're not familiar with them, then I'll explain. Their eyes are wide open. They are screaming and panicked, and yet they can't see you. And it's very, very hard to calm them down. And in the morning, you are exhausted, and they are fully rested because they had no idea they were half awake. So they're pretty terrifying as a parent. And I thought this would make a really interesting story of the what-if factor. What if my son actually knew things that he shouldn't know yet? Well, I suggested this to my agent, but she also knew that I'd come across a declassified account of German saboteurs who were dropped off by U-boat on the east coast of America in 1942. And there were eight of them that came, they literally rode onto shore in their German uniforms, if you can believe it. It's not the most subtle way to, to approach, but they were told that if they were caught without uniforms, they would be executed as spies, not held as POWs. So they did this. 
And then two of them immediately turned themselves into the FBI. They thought they were going to be heroes. Well, they made a deal with J. Edgar Hoover. You can imagine how that went. <laughs> yes. So all eight of them ended up being rounded up, put in front of a secret military tribunal, where there were several, seven generals who sat on there with no chance of parole or appeal. Sorry. They ended up being all found guilty within two months. Six of them ended up going straight to the electric chair. And the two that thought they'd be heroes were actually given 30 years and life hard labor in prison. So after the war, they were given executive clemency. They were sent back to an American occupied zone in Germany where they could never come back to America, never pardoned, and were treated as traitors for the rest of their lives over in Germany. So once again, I found a story of people who were caught between worlds. I, I shared this with my agent, which was probably a mistake. And she said, you know, Chris, I think that you actually have one book here, not two. And I thought, oh my gosh, you're right. She, she was very smooth. She ended up convincing me of this before, and I agreed before I realized this book would be longer and harder than anything I'd ever written before, because now I was intertwining present and past day with a mystery that went between the two. But I am very, very proud of that book. It brings me to my last book, The Edge of Lost. And speaking of Alcatraz, like I said, I was fascinated by the prison and as a kid, do you remember when HBO was actually a home box office that sat on your TV and you had to click it on? My kids have no understanding of what this means. <laughs> uh, that little red light was magical. And they had really a, a limited number of movies, right? They would play over and over again. And one of them was Escape from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood. And I was obviously an odd kid because I loved that movie and I'd watch it over and over. And so it came full circle when I decided to write a book about Alcatraz and discovered that there were actually kids who grew up on the rock. There were about 300 civilians, I was shocked to find out there were so many, that lived right there on the island, which I see some nods that you already knew that, which I was amazed that they had this really idyllic childhood that they grew up there. They had glee clubs and bands, and they would take the ferry over to school every morning. Parents, can you imagine today? Parents would send their kids alone on the ferry to go into San Francisco, where some of them actually caught cabs by themselves in order to take them to school every day. I thought, today, you know, PTA moms, we all like heart palpitations. And so I decided to write a story about kids that grew up on, the Al on Alcatraz. One in particular, she ends up going missing, 10-year-old daughter of a prison guard. And there's a convicted bank robber who's the only one who knows where she is and is keeping that secret for a very, very specific reason. And it backs up in time with an Irish immigrant tale that kind of goes through life in Ellis Island and speakeasies and all kinds of fun things, vaudeville and burlesque, and leads to Alcatraz in some way. So if, if I liked something about the 30s, it's probably in this book which I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed writing. Now, along the way, I researched quite a bit, like I said, about the prison, and I'll share just a couple things that I learned that were the most interesting to me. One is about the rule of silence. Now, I had no idea until I researched and went there that they had something called that. There was Warden Johnston decided to instill that during the time of Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly, which, by the way, supposedly some of those prisoners actually did mix with the children even though they were not supposed to. So you even had kids that, one boy in particular, that said that he would play checkers with Robert Stroud, known as the Birdman of Alcatraz, who was in solitary confinement the entire 11 years that he was there. So I was surprised to learn about some of these things that happened and the rule. And apparently what it meant was that these inmates could only speak just barely above a whisper and only at very specific times of the day. Now, some journalists and politicians claimed it was literally making the inmates insane, and so it was relaxed but never fully banned, and I thought that was fascinating. So you can imagine with that kind of rule and the absolute maddening monotony every day that they went through, that seeing that city right across the bay look so close, you know, although it's quite treacherous to get across there, as we, as we all know. And so it's not a surprise that there were so many inmates that actually literally tried to take the plunge there were actually three dozen of them that tried to escape that we know about. Probably a lot more that tried that we just have never heard of before. And because of the, the dankness and the cold concrete cells, they decided that they would get very creative and try to escape. And I will share with you my favorite story. And that is about pretty boy Floyd, who is better known as the getaway driver for Bonnie and Clyde. Well, he decided that he'd had enough of Alcatraz and all of the monotony and et cetera and all the rules. And so he ended up ganging up with three other inmates who came up with this elaborate plan. They tied up their supervising officer, the guard, right in the Model Industries building where they worked during the day. And they climbed out of there, and I'll show you what they did next. They ended up going over the fence and crawling down the steep cliff to the shoreline where one of them actually was killed 
one surrendered and we ended up and then one of them I believe uh, was let's see one surrendered one, one was captured there we go and the other one drowned and pretty boy Floyd ended up going into the caves and he hid out in there behind all of these tires that had been thrown off from the model industries building because they would cut it up for rubber for the Navy. And he hid underneath them and about three or four days later, the warden had searched and searched and they'd done these huge search parties all over the water and the city as you can imagine. And he declared that they caught Pretty Boy Floyd, they shot him and he drowned in the bay and everybody was safe. Except he was still in there. He ended up deciding after three or four days that he was tired of the hunger and the freezing cold temperatures and the snapping crabs that kept him awake all night long. You cannot make this stuff up. So he decided Alcatraz was better than that. And so he ended up going to the shore, crawling up the hill, over the fence, and back into the model industries building where he lay down and waited to be captured. <laughs> now this brings me, of course, to my latest book. <coughs> There is no clickbait that is more tempting for a historical fiction author that says 50 of the most shocking historical photos you have never seen. I'm sure you all clicked on it, right? <laughs> so I clicked, of course, and went down the rabbit hole. And what I found that day was this photo. It was printed in the Vedette Messenger in 1948. It's four children, of course, as you can see, on a stoop in Chicago in front of their own apartment building, supposedly offering, you know, offered for sale. The mother turned away from the camera. It looks like in shame. It looked to me like the Great Depression. I didn't realize until later when I started researching a bit that it was actually 1948. And that surprised me because I think of post-World War II as being such a prosperous time for the country and of course it wasn't for everyone. Now what it says is that she was offering them up for sale because she and her husband couldn't get work and were trying to you know, keep them fed, etc. And I remember going to a breakfast with some writer friends and sharing, I just don't understand how a parent can do this. How can you, I understand possibly giving them up for their betterment, but how can you ask for money in return? And she turned to me very profoundly and simply said, Christina, they wanted to eat. And I thought, you know what, she has a good point. I, I can't judge that without putting myself in her shoes or at least trying to. And so I, that photo ended up haunting me for quite some time. And I did some research then about the photo and the kids in it. And I ended up coming across an article, as you can see here, in the Northwest Indiana Times. It was soon republished in the New York Post and it came out about five years ago and it was about these kids who are still alive, the, the couple of them that were, that are now adults and how they were reuniting through social media and finally seeing each other after all these years because within two years of that photo being published, all, let's see, five of the children, she was actually, she became pregnant soon after the photo was taken, so there were five total, were, at, were actually sold or given away or taken away and one in particular, her name is Rayanne Mills, and she and I have actually become friends since, since I wrote the book, and I have a story about her as well. Her life could be an entire book in itself. And what she shared with me on the phone, which is the same as what she told the article, is that she was sold for $2 by, like in, from her mother to a farmer and his wife who came to their apartment one day and said they wanted to buy her as farm labor. She claims her mother agreed and took the $2 in front of her and said it was for bingo money. So it really is not the compassionate story that I was hoping for or thinking it might be, but of course there's a range of what everybody's circumstances were. And so I heavily debated on writing this story because there was also, I'll mention, her brother was involved. Brother started crying and saying he didn't want to be separated from his sister, so the farmer said, fine, we'll take him too. And they ended up keeping them on the farm until she was 17 years old and they worked as farm labor there and would even tie them up in the barn at night so they wouldn't run away. One of the other brothers was just a few miles away and he would ride his bike over and he would untie them every chance that he got. And I've actually become friends with him as well and his stories are pretty amazing. But he had a much better upbringing in his family than, than the brand did in hers. Now with all that in mind, I had a real hard time trying to imagine writing a novel about it because it seemed like there was a story there and I had enough author friends that were smart enough to say, Chris, don't let this go. You know, we joked that it was so depressing, Oprah would love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you know, I think there is something there because it just haunted me and it wouldn't let go of me. And yet, you're supposed to write what you love to read. And I just thought, gosh, this just seems so sad. And, you know, knowing so much about their true story. And so what I did was I went back to the article and found one mention that I'd kind of missed in the past. And that said that essentially, 
that the photo was staged by a reporter is what some of the family members claimed. Now, it doesn't change what happened to these kids, of course, and what, what happened to Rayanne in particular, but I did look at the sign again, and as you can see there, it just seems so perfectly painted. You know, there's even reflective accent marks on the letters, and I had a hard time picturing this mother painting that. And therein finally came the premise of my story that separated it a bit from some of this very, very dark places of the kids that you would go through in their minds. And that is about a reporter during the Great Depression who is ambitious and struggling, and he happens to cross, cross two kids on a farmhouse porch in rural Pennsylvania. And there's a sign that reads, Two Children for Sale. He snaps a photo because he's so taken aback by it, and yet he doesn't mean it for publication, and that is exactly where it leads. And it leads to his big break. And because of some interesting manipulations on his side that he thinks are seemingly harmless, there are devastating consequences for everybody involved in the photo. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so speaking of media and ripple effects, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're familiar, but um, Megyn Kelly's show just ended up ending very abruptly because of things that were said. However, in the midst of all that, in the very last week when it was all happening, Rayanne Mills, the woman in the middle, who was the girl that was sold for $2, and I got to meet in New York for the very first time after we've been on email and texting and phone calls for months, almost on a daily basis. So it was a pretty magical day, actually, and we got there and we uh, were interviewed then for the Today Show which was pretty amazing. And what I'll share with you is that it wasn't just about what happened to her then, but the fact that when she was 16 years old, she was walking home from a football game. And she was picked up by a drunken father uh, from another town by his pickup truck, who was apparently grieving over a lost child. It's very odd that it's tied to that. And he ended up taking her into the truck, and he raped her. And she ended up pregnant because of this. I told you, her, her life could be a book. They ended up putting her in an unwed mother's home to have the child, which she did, and she had a beautiful, healthy baby girl that she wanted to keep. She was told she could by her foster mother, as long as she named the child after her foster mother. I'm trying to understand that reasoning. So she named her Ruthie. And what happened was six months later, two women from an adoption agency ended up coming to the house, and she did not know who they were. They just started going through the baby clothes and said, can we please hold the baby? And her foster mother said, let, her, let, her, let the woman hold her. She handed it over at 17 years old, had no idea that the women were going to walk out the door. And she hasn't seen them since. Now, when Rayanne first shared that story with me, I asked her, Ray, has anybody ever given you a DNA test? And she said, no, I, I don't have the means for that. But her dream is to find her daughter and let her know she was wanted, unlike herself. So I said, I'm sending you a DNA kit tomorrow. And so we have been busy working together with the Salvation Army that ran the Unwed Mother's Home and trying to follow leads and working with genealogists and trying to find her daughter, which is why we also went on the show to have a call out for anybody that was born on that date in that area. So please send out good thoughts and prayers and keep your fingers crossed for us because we're hoping to make some good progress soon. Now, as far as other true things that inspired my story, Ellis, the reporter that I talked about, was actually partially inspired by a true story of an editor at the Toronto Star. He was the very first society editor who was male. At that time, that was not a compliment. <laughs> he was not thrilled. He thought that it was considered the fluff pages or the women's pages. He was also known as a sob sister, is what they would call them. And he was jokingly by his colleagues called Nellie, short for Nellie Bly, the female journalist. So I'm sure that that rubbed it in a bit more than he wanted. He tried so hard to get fired or move on from that position. They finally granted that. They moved him over, and they assigned the job to another man named Gordon Sinclair. Well, Gordon hated it just as much, except he was more active in trying to get fired. He ended up coming in every morning at 8 and leaving by 2. And only a year later did a proofer finally realize that almost every article he had turned in over the past year had been clipped from another newspaper. So he finally got his wish, and he ended up moving on to another position. As far as the inspiration behind the woman in the story, which is one of my favorites, named Lily, she is actually a uh, secretary for the editor-in-chief. And the best that she can do during the Great Depression, the fact that she has a job at all, is pretty incredible. Um, but she wants to be the next Nellie Bly, and she has so many obstacles in front of her, as you can imagine. So her story was very, very fun to write, something I didn't expect when I first set out. Now, what comes up again in, my, again in my stories is, like I said, about consequences of one single act. 
that are unintentional, which I find fascinating. And, and also just when you look back at your life and think how I'm even standing here today is because of one day that my grandmother said, Chrissy, I'm, I'm writing out all of my recipes by longhand for all the grandchildren. And I was hoping you could make copies of them, but I'm afraid I'm going to die before I finish writing them. There's so many recipes. Well, there's over a thousand. And she insisted that you needed at least seven different recipes of uh, carrot cake because they're all different. <laughs> so I said, well, Grandma, you need to cut this down or, you know, I can help you. And she said, if you have free time, could you type these out? And I don't know what I was thinking. I said, absolutely, Grandma. I will do that in my free time. And that's be the reason that, you know, this whole thing started and then the reason that I'm standing here today. So I think it's so fun we trace back our lives and that is absolutely uh, necessary for the story as well. Now, one example I wove into the story that I have to share with you because it is stranger than fiction is about a reporter who was working at the New York Herald Tribune uh, many decades ago. And he ended up saying that he was going to go out and find this legendary speakeasy called the Flying Dutchman. Now, everybody had heard of this at the time, but nobody could find it. And apparently, it was supposed to be this speakeasy on a ship that would float around and, and trying to evade the authorities. So he said he was going to, you know, take some notes and interview people and try to see what he could find out. Well, he went out for about a week or so, and he came back with the most incredible notes and said that he'd actually found this ship. Not only that, he had boarded it a couple times and rode it around and wrote these incredible, detailed, you know, information and notes that he wanted to put in an article about how much the drinks cost, what, what the old fashions and sidecars, you know, tasted like, the music they danced to, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this was huge news that he found it at all. So they ended up printing this, not just on the front page, but six column inches of the front page. He also included a hand-drawn map of where to find it. Now, this I find funny because I never saw it, but I can only imagine what that must have looked like, like a little ship, you know, with a triangle. And here's the ship with, you know, arrows pointing to it. And so you had all these reporters running around town also trying to find it now, I'm sure with this little map, uh, because this newspaper was selling out everywhere. It was huge, huge news. And he was asked to do follow-up article after follow-up article. And the authorities, the dry agents are running around town, also trying to find this elusive ship that I'm sure Hoover was not happy that they couldn't find, but a reporter could. As he st started getting questioned more and more, they started realizing that his story started crumbling a part of it. And only when it really crumbled did he leave a note on a desk and didn't come back and said, I'm sorry, I made it all up. Now, they don't really know why he did it. He was doing OK as a reporter at the time already. The only thing that they could figure out was he had shared with a friend before he left that for that entire week, where he was, apparently, was in a hotel with a really cute redhead. <laughs> so I had to shack up there, and apparently, she inspired all kinds of notes. <laughs> now, the other amazing story I came across was about a man named Mickey Duffy, who in Philadelphia, which is where part of my story takes place, was known as Prohibition's Mr. Big. Now, the only reason I share this is just to give you an idea at the time of the celebrity status of these guys, which is pretty incredible. We all know how reckless and ruthless they were. And what this story struck a chord with me is because he ended up, when he died, he was slain in his hotel room, uh, apparently by his own men. They held a funeral service for him. And there were thousands and thousands of people that showed up just to get a peek. And you actually had to have a special pass in order to get through a police line in order to go into the funeral. As far as other mobsters, can't mention any of them without mentioning Al Capone, of course. And I studied a lot about him since he also had to do with my story, The Edge of Lost. Uh, in this case, the only thing that I ended up incorporating in the story, because it was too good not to, was that I found out after the Valentine's Day massacre, which you can imagine, he, he felt his uh, reputation had been tainted a bit in the public eye, understandably so, because he wasn't just a celebrity then, but really, truly a killer he decided that he was going to improve that status by opening up bread lines and soup kitchens all around town. And so it was basically a big PR move. And I thought, my goodness, you know, these men, yes, they were ruthless, but they were also, when they, were, they did it well, they were very savvy businessmen, which is very odd. As for my own experience in the news industry, uh, I learned very early on, as you can see here, all about being in a newsroom and the deadlines of that and the excitement and the hustle and bustle because of this. When I was nine years old, it's hard to imagine now, but my mother decided that I was too shy. So she put me in one of those brilliant modeling acting courses that were just six weeks long. After six lessons, you supposedly were ready for Hollywood. <laughs> so I took this class, and it was just supposed to boost my confidence. And at the end, they said, by the way, there is this audition going on across town. It was Portland, Oregon's uh, ABC affiliate station. 
and it's this kids program that is a lot like a kids PM magazine. And she should just go and try out and just see what an audition is like. So I said, okay, that's fine. So my mother took me out there, and it was all these kids walking around with their scripts, and I was paired up with this little boy who clearly had been to thousands somehow of auditions in his very short life, and was not too thrilled about being paired up with a newbie. So we got paired up, and we were told to do this. When we got cued, we were supposed to run into the studio, jump on our chairs in front of these big cameras that had teleprompters on them, and we're supposed to say, hi, I'm Christina. Sorry for being late. Welcome to Popcorn. So they cue us. We run in. I jump on my chair, and I'm about to speak when I realize the chair is on rollers. So I flew one way, my chair flew the other way, ended up on the ground, and I giggled so much as I climbed back on my chair and delivered my lines that when we left, this poor little boy was horrified that I had killed his Hollywood dream. And the producer came running out and shook my mom's hand and introduced herself, and basically, I got the job. <laughs> so you never know where life is going to take you, clearly. But I will say this, when I started there at nine years old, I had no idea that I was going to be hosting that show for five years. I ended up retiring from it when I decided that show, hosting a show called Popcorn was not the coolest thing to do when you're in high school. So I started stepping away from it at that point. But all up until then, we would film every uh, Wednesday night, Tuesday nights, I'd get my script, I'd memorize them, and then I'd come into the studio, and we would film between the 6 o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news. So we had this very specific window of time. And after I would do the show, they would ask us to hang around for a few hours, just in case they need to reshoot anything. That was our only chance before showing it on Saturdays. And so I would hang out in the newsroom and became friends with the sportscasters and the anchors and et cetera. And watching that whole world go by, I thought it was very fascinating. And the best part about it was the meteorologist, or weatherman, as I knew him at the time, David Apple. He was the coolest guy ever because he had the corniest jokes and would sit and entertain me for hours. And he would let me take the special pen and move the clouds around, <laughs> which to me was very, very high tech at the time. <laughs> Speaking of high tech. I ended up pulling out this old typewriter that I have of mine to take some promotional pictures uh, just a few months ago. And my youngest son came running out, Kiernan, and said, Mom, that is so cool. Can I play on it? I said, you want to play on the typewriter? Oh, go for it. So he asked, how do you put the paper in? So I showed him how to put the paper in. And he starts typing, and he's like, this is so much fun. And I said, yes, isn't it fun? And it came all the way to the end of the cartridge. And he, said, he stared at it and said, now what do I do? How do I hit return? And I said, best part ever. Shink! And it makes that sound. My husband came and said, oh, is that the best sound ever? I'm like, it is, isn't it? So he's typing, typing away. And then my 15-year-old comes running down and says, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Can I play on it too? Absolutely. Suddenly, it's like the best thing in our whole household. And the 15-year-old, he's typing away, typing away. And they were having so much fun until they hit a typo. <laughs> and they looked at me and said, mom, where's the delete button? <laughs> I said, see, you know, you might know your iPads and iPhones and everything else, but I still know the typewriter, so we're all good. <laughs> now, before I wrap up, I'll just share with you, since I've heard there are book clubs in the room, um, that for a short time, I'm still offering some fun things on my website for book clubs. I'm actually giving away these party packs that have 1930s candy, which is not really from 1930s, so rest assured your teeth are okay, and also wine charms that are themed with the book because I visited about 100 book clubs in the last several years, and I can tell you they are truly... <laughs> From the laughter, I'm sure you know, they are wine clubs with books, people. I know this <laughs> firsthand. I've been to enough of them. So there's that. And there are also, even if you're not in a book club, they also, uh, my publisher put some amazing recipes and themed activities, all kinds of things on my website. So I hope you'll check that out. So thank you for listening to all of this. I will tell you that uh, I hope you think of my books the way that I think of historical fiction, which is like literary Advil and that you get a sugar coating of a story on the outside and hopefully you don't realize how much good stuff in history you're getting on the inside until you finish the book. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks for having me. This has been Book to the Library featuring Christina McMorris.